Sometimes it's really obvious that a video game is trying to make a point through architecture. Like, it's Art Deco o'clock and you're trapped in an undersea time capsule. But other times, things are more subtle. Architectural design keeps us immersed in a game's world, even if we don't notice it's there. It's like a secret language. And today we're going to explore how both architects and game designers use that language to influence the way that we move and the way that we feel. You might have some assumptions about what an architect actually does. At least one of your assumptions is right because architects do everything. Architects place plumbing and telephones. They consider the amount of natural light that enters each room. They have to think about how people need to use the finished space and how they'll feel there. They actually have a lot in common with game designers. For one, they both have to deal with code. Okay. Both game designers and architects are creating an experience. Whether you're navigating the corridors of Hyrule Castle or just trying to find your dentist's office, you're interacting with a system that someone built for you, the end user. So today we're going to look at four of the ways that architecture is speaking to you through space, construction, material, and light. Space is one of the many ways that architects control your mind, kind of. By space, I mean how much room is in a room. Architects use a concept called compression and expansion to manage movement. Long corridors use compression to encourage people to keep moving. And when they reach, say, an exhibit room or concourse and the space expands, they'll naturally start to meander and grab a Jamba Juice. People don't want to be in tight spaces. They always want to move to you know, wider or more open spaces. So you kind of use little psychological tricks like that in architecture in order to move people around. That's Stuart McDonald, the World Design Director for Control. Before he went into game design, he worked in and taught architecture. This pattern of small space, big space exists in plenty of games. It's most noticeable in boss arenas. You know that feeling you get when you enter a suspiciously large room and you know, you just know that stuff is about to pop off? You're reading architecture. You're literally reading the room. Ha! Now, Control has a very on-the-nose example of compression and expansion in the ashtray maze. In this level, you're funneled through a narrow, compressed hallway where all you can do is run forward until the maze literally expands and you fight a bunch of dudes. Even though it's not in the same brutalist style as the rest of the oldest house, the ashtray maze demonstrates why Control's architecture is so effective. The gameplay necessitates running and dashing and yeeting tons of furniture and eventually flying. And so the architecture supports that. The interior of the oldest house is mostly a series of overwhelmingly big interconnected rooms. It doesn't have very many corridors like the ones in the maze, even though in a real office building, you'd expect them. That would be a terrible gameplay space. So that's why we had to go kind of really sort of brutally open plan. That's not to say that we should throw out all corridors in games. And Remedy doesn't. The corridors that do appear in Control control you. They line you up to see or experience something exactly the way that Remedy wants you to. How big a space is can tell you how it's meant to be used. But there's plenty of other meanings built into the environment. We know what environmental storytelling generally means in a game. It's skeletons, or really meaningful graffiti. Stuff that's put there after the fact to tell you something happened. But architecture can also tell you a story about culture. For example, hostile architecture. Something like a low wall with spikes on it to prevent people who are unhoused from sitting or sleeping there. This wall tells you exactly who and what is valuable to the culture that constructed it. In Final Fantasy VII Remake, you visit Shinra employee housing on top of the Sector VII plate. These houses are blocky and impersonal, and there's a huge pipe running right through the neighborhood directly to the factory. Even the road points toward the factory, because in Midgar, Shinra is all that matters. Of course, not every example of architectural storytelling is quite so bleak. Sean, who's known on YouTube as the Lore Hunter, is an architectural designer. And one of his favorite examples of thoughtful construction is from Dark Souls. Anor Londo is just 
pivotal point in Dark Souls 1. It's the first time that something looks nice and put together. They really got in the headspace of sort of an architect when they were looking at Anne Orlando because there's two different sets of steps. Notice the stairs on each side are normal size, but the stairs in the center are huge. Why? Well, Anne Orlando used to be shared by giants and humans, and the architecture reflects that. And this design is pure storytelling. There's no mechanical difference whether your character walks up the center stairs versus the sides. It doesn't make a difference, it's really. So it's just this architectural decision by the game designers makes it a place. And as soon as it's a place, that helps with immersion. So environmental storytelling is the graffiti on the wall. It's also where the wall is and who the wall is protecting. And it's what the wall is made of. The most gruesome thing in the world is touching a subway pole in the middle of summer and feeling warm metal. And it's a little greasy. Why is it greasy? And you can see your sweaty face reflected in it. This makes you upset. All of these sensations are possible because the subway pole is made of metal. It's a practical choice for a material, but it has all sorts of consequences. Something weird about architects is you can identify an architect if they're going around touching buildings. Architects do that weird ass thing because touching materials helps them understand what existing in a space will feel like for the end user. We have baked in associations with materials, memories of touch that influence our emotions. Even though games are largely incorporeal, game designers use materials the same way that an architect might, to evoke feelings. Yoshi's Woolly World would read entirely differently if it were Yoshi's Concrete Commonwealth. Yoshi's Dirt Duchy. I spoke with Ben Garbo, an architectural designer who creates laboratories with spill-proof rubber flooring and metal surfaces, Natch. But Ben doesn't just think about chemical disasters when he's designing a lab. He balances practicality with psychology. People aren't going to be doing good research unless they feel good in the lab, right? If they feel sort of soul crushing by like just existing in the lab you've designed, then that's ultimately not a, a successful building. In the service of making people feel good, Ben might add more organic materials, like wooden cabinet fronts to warm up the space. But not all workplaces strive for comfort, and in Portal, materials tell us a story of discomfort and extreme workplace negligence. Midway through the game, the sleek concrete and glass test chambers give way to rusted metal and really gross linoleum. It's literally falling apart. And so you're getting like sort of hints at like the seams bursting open a little bit. And you go through like into the final portion of the level and you are firmly outside the bounds of where you're supposed to be, or where you thought you were supposed to be in this game. The contrast tells us clearly where in the lab we belong and where we don't. And it's all the more powerful because the player is hyper aware of materials anyway. We need concrete to make portals, so seeing the very necessary concrete covered in grime and handprints? Ugh, it's upsetting. But there's another huge difference between portals test chambers and the back end. That's the light. Like physical materials, light is practical, artistic, and psychological all at once. It's also the architectural tool that ties everything else together. It interacts with materials, it fills a space, and the presence, or lack of it, tells a story. In games and in real life, lighting tells us where we should be, either by pointing the way, or just by saying it's safe. And game designers are great at using darkness to make us feel unsafe. Gone Home takes place in a cozy Pacific Northwest house. It checks all of the boxes we've been talking about. Spacious rooms, warm materials like wood and cloth. This is a normal ass house for a normal ass family. And yet. Because we have to go into so many dark rooms and switch on the lights, it's terrifying. The game's designers knew exactly what they were doing by making lighting so central to the gameplay. They turned something cozy into a haunted house. In Control, light is built into the walls of the oldest house, into the ceilings and into these columns. Without it, the concrete might not have wowed us as much as it does. In games, it's hard to recreate the way that light behaves, bouncing off of surfaces and making pockets of shadow as well as brightness. 
The art design in older games reflects this. So before artists would put in lots of rust stains and lots of cables and little details and grime and dirt because um, the wall would just look boring, the, the light wouldn't read. And the good thing is that now we're moving into the, the era of like real-time ray tracing and all that technology that kind of allows us to, to actually light things uh, much more realistically. Stewart and his team had the freedom to leave concrete surfaces bare because Remedy's lighting technology lets the walls be interesting without being covered in stuff. As game technology improves, game designers will be able to think more like architects, harnessing better graphics and processing power to make material textures pop, to build complex lighting systems, and to create detailed spaces that toy with our emotions. And those same game technologies are helping future architects too. I think more and more we see um, urban design or architectural practices, knowing how to work in game engines is kind of a sought after skill in those industries as well. Sandra Yukana and Luke Pearson run a master's course where the next generation of architects and urban designers make games. The students use traditional design software like SketchUp and Rhino, but they also learn Unity and coding languages like C Sharp. In one of their games, the player character has a pair of augmented reality glasses that let them digitally opt in to the European Union. So the player can pop back and forth between life in a Europe-connected UK or a post-Brexit one. I think it also lets us see games and architecture as more than, more than tools, as something which allows people to engage with the social and cultural impact of the work that they're producing. And by making games, the students are learning to think about games and architecture as tools of communication. They have to consider who the end user is and what their creation is saying to them and how it's saying it. By making games, they have to deal with how information is communicated to someone, the player, because if your game is completely, you know, like impossible to understand, then the first feedback you'll get is like, that's rubbish, it doesn't make any sense, I can't play it. And so it, it, it allows them to get really, I think, a conversation going between designers and the people that use architecture. Buildings don't live in designs or on draft paper. When they're built, they have the power to make us happy or sad. They can invite us in or push us away. Architects design in ways that subtly tell us what to do and what's important. And now you understand more of their language. I didn't have time to talk about this in the script, but when architects finally become like certified architects, they get a physical actual stamp. And that's what they use to stamp their drawings. Uh, and it basically says like, yeah, I take responsibility for this. This is my stamp. If the building falls down, it's on me, y'all. I think that's so cool. I want a stamp. <laughs>